Good morning, everybody. I'm happy to see so many people here after the lovely dinner yesterday night. Um, welcome to the plenary session three, Migrants and Ethnic Minority Health in the Context of a Global Crisis, Conceptual Frameworks for the 21st Century Research and Policy Making. Yesterday, we were looking at the uh, origin of the crisis and some of the problems that has been uh, generated uh, on migrants' health and access to healthcare due uh, in this context of economic crisis. Today, we will uh, start by thinking how best we should approach uh, this problem. For that, we have uh, invited our two uh, speakers, Dr. Kathy Zimmerman in, in the first place, uh, who is a um, social uh, behavioral scientist uh, working at the Department of Global Health and Development at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, she has focused uh, her work on vulnerable uh, migrants and health. She has a wide experience in uh, health and human trafficking and she was one of the first in conducting studies of, on this uh, subject on women. She is the, in, uh, the author of uh, many international materials uh, on this um, area. And her writing includes as well um, edited series of, uh, on migrant health. And therefore, we have invited her to present uh, her framework, uh, Population, Mobility and Health, a Migration Framework for the 21st Century Policy Making and Research. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you for joining us. And you have 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. Really fast. Um, hi. I just wanted to say first thank you to the organizers. I Walking around here yesterday with all the different research going on, I felt like a, a child in a candy store. It was really amazing being amidst all of you who are doing all this fascinating research. Um, and so now, I guess my question is, who should be sitting around the table when we start making migration and health policies? That's it. Five minutes, over. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you for keeping up to the time. And um, now we will uh, uh, give uh, the word to David, and will you please keep your comments and questions for the end. Um, now uh, we, I, we have invited uh, Professor David Ingleby who is professor at the Center for Social Science and Global Health of the University of Amsterdam. He asked me to give uh, his introduction, introduction very brief. So I only will say uh, about his long career that he has migrated himself uh, several times. He has moved from country to country. He has worked in England, Holland, and Sweden. And he has also migrated uh, between disciplines, so from psychology to social sciences and public health. And his, uh, he said, if you want to know more about his CV, you will find it on internet. <laughs> <laughs> he defends the need to integrate different uh, uh, theoretical frameworks to work in the area of migrants and health. And therefore, we have invited him to make his presentation today and he will present his talk on walking and chewing gum at the same time, why intersectionality is important to health equity. David? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I should first of all mention, um, I was a bit worried about the timing, so I thought maybe uh, I better upload my presentation in case I don't get to uh, read all of it. Uh, I don't know if you can read this, but this is, this is bit late. Um, <coughs> so you can actually uh, download it, and if you like, you can leave now and have a cup of coffee and uh, <laughs> <laughs> read it another time. Um, <coughs> but this is what I'm going to be talking about. I have just two topics. The first one is um, refers to the fact that work on migrant and ethnic minority health and socioeconomic differences is carried out by different communities of researchers and policy makers. 
There is a certain amount of overlap, but to a large extent, the communities are segregated from each other. It's, it's a little bit like two ethnic groups that don't get along. And, and I will argue that has, this has no rational justification and it's a barrier to progress in, in both departments. And um, <coughs> secondly, I, uh, I want to say that uh, we don't need barriers to progress at the moment, especially now. The obstacles to achieving health equity are stronger than ever. They, they're getting stronger, they're not getting weaker. And many of the obstacles are the product of the European Commission's own austerity policies. And all the keynotes up to now have, have underlined this. But I want to add another message, uh, that the movement for health equity is weak because it is fragmented. People working on socioeconomic factors, or ethnicity, migrant status, sex, disability, and so on, They're all working in different silos. Um, uh, yeah. I enjoyed <laughs> Kathy's presentation very much, but she stole my slide on <laughs> silos. <laughs> so I'm afraid you're going to see even more of these things. Uh, and. Um, because the work is fragmented, it's very easy to ignore. So the message is, the take-home message is, we, we have to get our act together. We have to join forces to develop an intersectional approach. <coughs> so here we, here we go, you see. I, I chose different ones, but <laughs> uh, a tale of two silos. There's, there's plenty written about this topic on a theoretical basis, on a theoretical level, um, but recently there's a very nice publication uh, by uh, DG Sanko, or more correctly, it's called uh, Chafia. It used to be called EAHC, our old friend, but it's now called Chafia. Uh, and this is Action on Health and Inequalities in the European Union. It's a brochure. It's, an, it's a description of the two health programs, the first and second health programs between 2003 and 2013. Uh, and apart from a description of the actions, uh, it also contains an analysis of them. And this, this is what I'm going to focus on. Uh, it classifies 64 actions along the following, hello, yeah, along the following dimensions. Uh, which types of health inequalities are addressed? Which health problems are targeted? Um, and what kinds of interventions are proposed? So those are the basic uh, ways in which you can divide, um, in, in which you can distinguish actions from each other. Now, to a certain extent, there there is a logical relationship between these three, if you think about it. If you're going to investigate socioeconomic differences, you, you have to focus on health problems for which you have good data. If you want to cover the whole population, you have to have a, a data set that covers the whole population, and preferably in the whole of Europe, so you can look at international differences as well. And so that's why you get um, typically mortality rates or uh, self-assessed health or very general measures are used in that type of research. Concerning interventions, well, if you're doing research on, on a, a group with a present acute health problem, you're going to focus on interventions that involve treatment, uh, short-term prevention, harm reduction, in other words, first aid. There's nothing to be ashamed of in, in providing first aid if, if that's what's needed. And because the dimensions are correlated in this way, um, you can carry out dimension reduction on them. You can do a factor analysis. And on page 24 of the brochure, that is exactly what's been done to, to look at the clustering. Um, it shows this. This diagram shows the actions in the space of the first two principal components. And that is simply a way of representing uh, the clusters, the, sorry, representing the actions in terms of how similar they are to each other. So the, the dots 
you can't, probably can't read the labels, but it's all in the book. The dots that are very close together are actions that uh, resemble each other a great deal in terms of their target group and uh, health problems and method of uh, intervention. And we end up, we end up there with three uh, separate clusters. And the horizontal dimension is quite recognizable as vulnerable groups versus health gradients and gaps. On the right-hand side, you have um, the, the type of research that we, we know very well, the more recent type of research. Um, and on the left, perhaps for Tichisanko, a more classical kind of research, uh, which can be further subdivided into the red group, at-risk groups, and the, uh, the lower cluster, which includes migrants and ethnic minorities. So in fact, these are not just target groups, these are whole paradigms, these are whole styles, uh, ways of, of doing research and proposing interventions. The ones on the right tend to be more academic and theoretical, a very strong input from epidemiology. The ones on the left are rooted in a tradition of uh, if you like, street-level work with vulnerable groups, with strong participation from NGOs, and, and also participation by the target group, which is not something you get in, in work on the uh, socioeconomic gradient, for example. <coughs> the at-risk groups are um, what you might call people, people living dangerously, uh, sex workers, intravenous drug users, uh, people living with HIV AIDS, sometimes people in all three categories at the same time. And the focus there is mainly on infectious disease and, and harm reduction. And when we look at the migrants and ethnic minorities, that's less of a focus. There is some overlap, for example, EpiSouth. Um, some of you have be, been in these programs, you know what they are. <coughs> but the migrant with, with migrants and ethnic minor minorities, you have more attention to NCDs, non-communicable diseases. Um, so if we, we really need to repaint our silos, put different labels on them, and uh, this, is, this is really what the split is about. The, that's the lesson that we get from this brochure. There are, there are two big traditions in this type of work, in health inequalities work, and, and that's what they are. And, and my message is quite simple, you know, they have to integrate better. Let's, let's take the lid off these silos and look at what goes on inside them. Well, um, the, the uh, columns are the paradigms or styles, <coughs> vulnerable groups versus health gradients and gaps. Now, these are the, ty these are the targets the types of inequalities which they study. Um, there is a certain, in a sense, there's an overlap because uh, if you take a health, uh, if, if you take an epidemiological approach, you can also look at group differences. But the people on the right tend to, they prefer working with whole populations mm -hmm. rather than individual uh, groups in need. Um, the health problems, as I've said, very strong with the, with the at-risk groups, very strong focus on infectious disease, health gradients, looking at much more general measures because more specific measures are not readily available. You know, there, are, there are not good data sets covering the whole of Europe on, on particular conditions. And the interventions proposed, well, short term or long term, you could say. Summing up, you could say that the vulnerable groups tradition focuses on groups and, and downstream factors, and the, the health gradients and gaps approach looks at the whole population, looks at upstream factors, and um, basically intersectoral action. So what you see in, in this brochure is um, very clear evidence of two different approaches to health inequalities. 
But is it really fair to talk about these as uh, silos? It's a bit denigrating. Um, first of all, it's not completely true because there are some actions which seem to be in the wrong silo. That means there's something different, there's something creative or original about them. Uh, there are two recent actions on Roma Health, which are in the epidemiological uh, silo. Uh, but these tend to be recent actions, and, and they're rather, as I say, rather innovative. And secondly, you could say, what's wrong with having two different approaches? Um, you, you could find this anywhere. You could, if you analyzed, if you did a factor analysis of projects on pediatrics or gerontology, you'd probably find two, two uh, clusters of, of work. Now, why call that silos? Well, my reason for calling it a silo is that the, the two approaches have got stereotyped. They've got fossilized. They tend to ignore each other, but in fact, uh, to a large extent, they're working on the same issues and they have a lot to learn from each other. So what would happen? If you think outside your silo, well, vulnerable groups' work would pay more attention to upstream factors and to data collection, to getting good epidemiological data. Uh, the health gradients tradition would pay more attention to health services. It's what we don't get in uh, socioeconomic research. We assume, if in, especially in Europe, we say, well, the poor and the rich get the same care, but they don't. There are very big socioeconomic uh, differences. So um, that, that's basically the conclusion of that part. We need to shake up the, the kind of work that we do. Um, at present, it's separated not just in, in uh, the work which Gigi Sanko has financed, but also by uh, in government departments. You get different groups of specialists studying these different types of equalities. Now, the second point uh, I want to make is this is a disastrous situation because um, work on health equities, uh, uh, health, yeah, health equity or inequities, is very itself very vulnerable at the moment. It is being marginalized. And if you have two different stories about health inequalities, then they undermine each other's credibility. The politicians and the public hear conflicting messages and they believe neither of them. And I think we are much too optimistic about the support we enjoy and the influence that we have. And, and I'm going to focus on the EU's, um, yeah, I'll do my best. <laughs> The EU's, uh, the European Commission's support for tackling health inequalities, um, because I think this is very questionable. If we look at um, projects, how has the EU supported projects? We see something very interesting in the brochure that in 2009 the EC published a communication solidarity in health, which was supposed to be the rallying call to everybody to tackle health inequalities. What happened to the financing for projects by the EC? It went down. It became yeah, 3% uh, last year. If we look to the, I mean, the best time to be doing this was in 2006, by the way. <laughs> um, if we look forward to the third health program, the news is also, the outlook is also a bit uncertain. We don't really know what's in the program until we see the call. But this is, this is how it's publicized. It's got a huge blob in the middle talking about redu reducing health inequalities. But if you actually look at that blob, you see it doesn't exist. It's called a cross-cutting objective uh, for which there is no separate financing. You have to find that in the other blobs. And when you look, you don't find any reference to health inequalities. There's something on cross-border health threats, which could be taken. Yeah, you could do work on migrants, but um, basically inequalities are not in the program. As such, you have to invent a way of putting them in. And when we diagnose this, 
We can look at the impact analysis which the Commission itself did on the third health programme. And you see, it was very explicit. Increasing equalities is the challenge. We have no policy on it. We have no specific objective. It's not in the, um, uh, what is the multi-annual financial framework. And it's addressed only partially. Lo lower down in the document, you see the reason Option four would require a considerable increase in investment. It corresponds to a substantial increase in the budget, which is simply not realistic. Now, why is it not realistic? How much did it cost? We have no idea how they arrived at this conclusion. In fact, this, this type of work is relatively cheap. If you can compare it with work on uh, high-tech medical technology, so it's clear that a, an a priori decision was made to cut down work on inequalities. Let's move on to policy changes to reduce health inequalities. Um, well, there, there are some very optimistic statements. For example, Department of Wishful Thinking published this one. Uh, the EU has extended the right of migrants to equal treatment in social security, including health care, to all third country nationals. Uh, we were a bit surprised to read this in, in the ADAPT program because um, we know it's not true. Uh, the, the entitlements are very diverse. And it's, there's a simple reason why it's not true. Firstly, each member state can decide what they want on this question, and secondly, social security does not include health care. So I still have to have an explanation of what that means, that first statement. Uh, how did the EU do this conjuring trick? Last week, a new paper was published, I'm getting there, <laughs> yeah. uh, on effective, accessible, and resilient health systems, not inclusive or equitable, but then, you know, we have to keep titles short. Um, what does it say? It says that... Um, sorry. It, it, it focuses on healthcare for citizens. The word used for a user of healthcare is a citizen throughout the document. It doesn't say anything about non-citizens, but they're there also. Migrants are not citizens of the country they live in undocumented migrants in particular. So um, the news on policy is bad. Uh, when we look at the austerity program, the news is even worse. Well, I don't, I don't have to go into this. You heard excellent uh, talk from Martin McKee about this. The attack was on the European social model, which means universal health care coverage, social protection, social transfers, all vital instruments for promoting health equity. So the whole austerity program was an attack on health equity. And yet the EU says today on the website, all EU policies are required to follow a health in all policies approach. In other words, the health impact must be assessed and, of course, it wasn't. Uh, so I've yet to hear what the explanation is for that. Um, health inequalities are more and more described by the Commission as lying outside the area of health policy. So this is my ending, final question. What happened to the EC's commitment to health equity? It was always a paper commitment it's not backed up by financing, it's not backed up by the co policies in Brussels. You see, don't, don't, don't get my message wrong. I'm not attacking the people in Luxembourg. But Luxembourg is so far from Brussels that when the people in Luxembourg shout, you don't hear it in Brussels. I think that's why they were put there in the first place. So in other words, you know, the EC is not a single entity. Uh, but uh, the people in, in Luxembourg still deserve our support, and, and we still need their support. Um, but we need, to, going back to my first thing, we need to join forces 
and develop more effective strategies um, if we're to have any hope of, of getting anywhere. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, I think we have uh, some food for thinking. And now I open the floor for comments and questions. Please, uh, yeah. Um, a microphone, please. There. In, in the lady in the middle. Thank you. My name is Gudrun Schlemmen. I'm working in Austria with migrants too. And what an, I'm very happy about the discussion now. Because w what I missed already and what I still miss, you say uh, you want to uh, difference between uh, even to take care of the wording of uh, migrants. But most of the time we're talking here about refugees and as asylum seekers. But the bigger majority in Austria, migrants are living there for years already. Uh, having the migrant status, and they are the ones uh, which are excluded as well. So we are not talking about those quite often, and I'm more interested how can and how does inclusion work with them? Because there are big groups of uh, society, and they have to be addressed, and I don't think it's always right to talk about them, about vulnerable groups, because we don't see the resources, and we are here in the discussion often talking about the lacks, and we are not also often talking about uh, resources oriented health and how can you use them and how can you uh, talk with people, for example, when you had the who should be in integrated when you talk about uh, health, Katie Zimmerman. Uh, maybe I didn't see it, but I didn't see that the migrants were there as well. So I like, there was immigration and everybody, but I didn't see the migrants themselves. So where is the parti participation of migrants themselves and how can we uh, help them to get their own voice more in, the, uh, in a really integration uh, society? How can they get into research? How get, can they get jobs like that? And um, how can they be more institutionalized? So thank you for that. And, and I think for the last one about the money, I think there's a lot of people out there who would like and who do a lot of self-organization, trying uh, to work for better health, but it's very difficult even for them to get for the EU money because it's such a high level structure as well. It's not easy for NGOs and little NGOs and especially migrant NGOs are very little ones. So we have a very high level how to overcome that. Thank you. You raised a number of very important issues. I mean, to take um, one of them, the question of participation, I, I absolutely agree with you about this. That, and I'm running a, a network at the moment called ADAPT, where we look at migrant and minority health policies and uh, it's the blind spot in every action and every policy the the promise i mean it's the difference between rhetoric and reality we talk about participation but we never achieve it because the participatory mechanisms that we use are not inclusive they are exclusive they privilege the mainstream so i agree with you entirely about that i'm not sure i agree with you that labor migrants are neglected uh, there is a lot of attention for asylum seekers and undocumented <coughs> migrants, but um, there's also a lot. It, you may not notice it because it, it goes under the heading of ethnic minority research, because once people are established, they tend not to be called migrants anymore. They are, in the United Nations definition, they're, they're people not living in their country of birth, but the, in the man in the street, woman in the street, doesn't call them migrants, but minorities. There is another question here, and then yeah. Raj. Yeah. Uh, no, mm -hmm. Wait, ask. Yes. Okay, you have yeah. a second, but I uh, <laughs> give you. <laughs> uh, 
I'm Raj Bhopal from University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Firstly, thank you to both speakers. I think they both raised very important points, particularly around concepts and terminology, etc. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's probably correct that we are a divided um, group of people, and maybe we can help ourselves, start with ourselves. I mean, a few years ago, we changed the name of our section from uh, Migrant Health Section to Migrant and Ethnic Minority Health Section. I think that was a good step forward. Mm. We also um, tried to bring in the Roma people a couple of years ago by inviting them mm -hmm. to participate very fully in our affairs. Um, we also um, have started to double in inequalities, but I can't see how the inequalities field can be a subset of the migration and ethnicity field, but the migration and ethnicity field can be a subset of the inequalities field. Yes. I mean, I think we have to put ourselves in that place, uh, and we have to recognize that. And we have to go forwards to people who are very powerful in this field, like the social determinants of health field, and say, look, we are part of your uh, action, and we want to be a part. So I think we can more actively place ourselves there. But I think I would, li I would like to make a call that people actually we unify ourselves first, because um, those who work in... Uh, with uh, irregular migrants. They seem to think that they only work with irregular migrants, so there's nothing else of any importance. Um, and those who work with ethnicity, like myself, uh, we try to, we try to uh, embrace everything else within that. Um, maybe we need to understand ourselves a bit better and, and, and work more closely together. And I would like to see the indigenous health field, um, and we do have uh, indigenous minorities in, in Europe as well, uh, but there's uh, half a billion across the world that we've put into the group as indigenous minorities, mostly in China and India. Um, and uh, then the Roma health, uh, the ethnic minority health, and the migrant health, uh, immigrant health really, it's not really migrant health, it's immigrant health we're talking about, and immigrants from particular places, not all places. And uh, we can unify ourselves, and within our own field, maybe we could put more emphasis on socio-economic inequalities within the groups that we study. And then I think we should actively, uh, through our section, try to uh, build up an alliance with the social determinants of health people. Absolutely. I agree. <laughs> there is another intervention yeah. here, or do you want to answer? I, well, uh, yeah, just to keep it simple, um, I, I agree 100% uh, uh, with, with, with everything you say. Uh, it's, but uh, especially the, um, the the need to link the two agendas, mm -hmm. and what bothers me still a lot is I come across many articles and websites and projects which say they're about social determinants of health and only talk about socioeconomic status. They they just forget about any other kind, and and it's not just that migration and ethnicity go out of the window, but so do gender, age, disability, all kinds of variations. So it's a, it's a monovariate approach, and it's not getting anyone anywhere. I, I think we take some intervention now, first yes. here and then there, and, uh, and over there, and then you answer, yeah? Please. <coughs> Thank you very much. Daniel Lopez Acuña, World Health Organization, Geneva. Um, I just wanted to highlight and to really underscore the, the point that Kathy made on the need of differentiating or disaggregating the category of migrants. In the extent that we continue lumping together under the title of migrants, mm -hmm. groups that, yes, may have some connection with migration but have very different logics and legal points of insertion in countries, we are not going to be contributing much to the evidence base for policy making in favor of the migrants. I think it's fundamental to separate very clearly the big issue of the access to health care for irregular migrants, which I think is in the center of the debate globally, but also in Europe, from other issues that may be related to inequities associated to the migrant status of the then ethnic minorities, as David was mentioning, that are more permanent feature of societies. If not, we are going to be mixing pears and apples and not helping to the arguments yeah. that we need to advance. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Uh, over there. Uh, 
uh, Mark Schenker, University of California, Davis. I think the discussion of the different separation silos in the public health community is a very good one. And my observation is that a lot of the silos I see are disciplinary, not in how the problem is viewed. And so we have the sociologists and the anthropologists and the economists who are working in their own cultures and their own uh, language and their own uh, societies. And, you know, it, it's another problem in, in dealing with this because they have a lot to contribute, but, but there are a lot of historic and cultural differences between those silos that prevent them from coming together. Uh, so we, we have two challenges. One is within the health community, as it were, and the other is between these different disciplines that in many cases have been working on this issue for, for a very long time mm -hmm. and uh, need to be engaged. Yeah, okay. We have one more contribution and then I give a word, to, but we are running out of time. <laughs> one more over there, please. The microphone. There. Hi. Um, my name is Sylvia Gendelman. I'm from the University of California, Berkeley, and um, I enjoyed both uh, the presentations very much. Um, it's interesting coming from a U.S. perspective to hear um, your perspectives in Europe, and um, I think I'm in total agreement with you that it started with the U.N. Commission, the Sir Marmot, Marmot's Commission on Socioeconomic Determinants of Health, which does not go beyond the economic determinants of health. But you, you have a problem in Europe that I think needs to be sort of overcome, unless I'm missing something in translation. There's a big elephant in the room here, um, and I think that it has to do with the fact that you are only acknowledging refugees and people who are seeking asylum and, and then the irregular immigrants. But what about the fact that you are sort of a, an evolving recent conglomerate of uh, people from different countries of origin and, and the fact that you absorbed so many new countries um, I think that those people are also vulnerable, your internal migrants. You're almost only looking at the sort of immigrants who are coming from these third world countries as it was posted in, in something that David showed. And, and these tend to be sort of the irregular people um, when in fact uh, you have a lot of new members of your union who probably become quick prey for ethnic mi minoritization. And I think that there's a, a sense here that you need to be far more open as a society to see, okay, who is a minority who, or who is at risk of being in a hierarchy that is in a lower social hierarchy. And these issues, I think, mm -hmm. need to be discussed more openly here. Thank you, so I, th I think we're accumulating too many questions to answer. We, okay. <laughs> we, have, we have to finish, so if you yeah. can give a, another yeah. I'll just say one thing related to Mark's point, and then I'll let you address Sylvia's. Um, I, I think Mark's absolutely right. We have a disciplinary problem. But the other thing I wanted to say is um, about research on migrants. And one of the problems I've seen is when you look up studies for um, health, you often find that because researchers don't want to have to mess around with the cultural differences, especially when they're using scales and more um, standardized tools, people are doing research on certain national nationalities and certain ethnic groups and dividing them all up. And people who do work across different migrant groups and different nationalities and different language groups there's a lot of critique about that research, but the problem is we're not making policies on Ethiopians, and we're not making policies on Somalis. We're making policies on 
refugees, asylum seekers, m migrant labor. And so I would encourage everyone to please start trying to find ways to incorporate this more holistically across different nationalities and ethnicities. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes, um, I one, one uh, another pair of silos concerns migrant studies, which is a very exciting field full of uh, sociology, anthropology, and so on, and almost never considering health. I've been trying to get in there for, for 10 years, and, and they're not interested. Uh, but we, we should be more interested in them. Finally, about the third country nationals or third world uh, immigrants, most of them are not asylum seekers or undocumented migrants, but family, it's family reunion that brings them to Europe. And um, I agree entirely that internal EU migration can also be just as problematic, if not more so, definitely. Uh, well, uh, we ran out of time. I'm sorry, we have to finish here the session. I only wa I wanted to make a final remark because I, I don't know why you are getting the feeling we are only focusing on irregular and refugees and as asylum seekers because the main uh, work uh, presented during the conference is related to uh, regular migrants who are working here. So I invite you to put more attention to the different uh, works presented here and look at what sort of uh, migrant or ethnic minority I've been looking look at. Thank you very much for your attention and please go to the coffee.